Hello everyone, this is Mr. Caviani, and by the end of this video, you should be able to use Newton's second law to solve problems involving multiple tensional forces. We're going to solve a series of example problems, and I'd like to remind everyone of the DeGepsa problem-solving process before we do. Number one, always draw a sketch or picture when you're solving a problem. Step two, draw your interaction diagram, and then step three, draw your force diagram for the object you are interested in. Step four will be to split any angled forces into its horizontal and vertical components, and then redraw your force diagram showing these components if applicable. We'll then write out the sum of all forces in the horizontal and vertical directions separately and use Newton's second law in each direction to solve for any unknown variables. We will be using this process for each problem we solve today. To start out with a basic example involving tension, we're given a 68 kilogram chandelier is hanging from the ceiling by a metal chain, and we're asked to solve for the magnitude of the tension force that the chain exerts on the chandelier. I'll begin by drawing an interaction diagram since I'm already given a sketch on the right. I've gone ahead and listed all of the objects in my system, and I've indicated the interactions as shown. Next, I'll draw a force diagram for the chandelier itself. In this case, there are only two forces acting on the chandelier the earth pulling the chandelier downwards, and the chain pulling the chandelier up. Now that I have my force diagram, I'll write out the sum of forces in each direction, both the horizontal, or x, and the vertical, or y. There are no horizontal forces in this scenario, so I know the sum of all forces in the x direction will be zero. If I call up positive, then the chain on the chandelier will be positive, and the earth on the chandelier will be a negative force. And here I have abbreviated chain on chandelier as ch on c. Now that I've written out the sum of forces in each direction, I'll set these equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration in that direction. This is Newton's second law. In this case, the chandelier is at rest. In other words, it's not moving. So I know the acceleration in both the x and the y direction will be zero. Because I'm looking for the magnitude of the force that the chain exerts on the chandelier, I can go ahead and rearrange this y equation um, since I know that it's equal to zero. I can take this a step further because I know that the force the earth exerts on the chandelier is equal to the mass of the chandelier times g, which is 9.8. If I plug in my values, then I get a force of approximately 670 newtons, rounding to the nearest uh, 10 newtons. This is a basic example involving one tensional force and one object. Let's take a look at a more complex example. In this example, we're given that an 80 kilogram man is hanging from the ceiling supported by two cables shown to the right. Uh, we have a, an angle associated with each cable uh, between the ceiling and that cable. And we're asked to solve for the magnitude of the tension force in each cable. Now, while this is a more complex example, the process for solving this problem is no different. We'll begin by drawing an interaction diagram and then a force diagram. I've listed each of the objects in my scenario, and I've labeled my interactions like so. We're going to start assuming that the ropes don't have mass themselves to simplify the problem-solving process, so I'm not going to show the force of gravity between the earth and the two ropes, but realize this is an assumption that may not always be a good assumption. Nonetheless, it's one we'll make when solving these problems. Because I'm asked to solve for the magnitude of the tension force in each cable, I'm going to draw a force diagram for the person, since the person experiences a tensional force between each rope. This makes them the most useful object to look at when solving this problem. Instead of drawing a box for the person, I'm going to represent their body as a dot. This will make it easier to show all of the forces on my diagram. I know there are three forces acting on the person two tensional forces, and the force of the earth exerted on the person's body. So I'll show those forces in at the angle that they appear. I've gone ahead and labeled the left rope as rope 1 and the right rope as rope 2 for simplicity. Now, I've drawn in the angle of the force directly as it's showing up on my diagram. So in the upper right-hand corner, you can see here that rope pulls in this direction, and this rope pulls in this direction. Now, the angle is given to you up here. But I know that if I draw a horizontal line that is parallel to the ceiling, then this angle and this angle are identical. Same goes for this 48 degrees. Because this horizontal line is parallel to the ceiling, and the line that bisects these two parallel lines 
the opposite angles will be identical, right? This is through geometry. So I know that that's the angle that it forms with the center of mass here and the two ropes. So on my diagram, I can draw in a horizontal reference line here and show that angle. This is going to be really important when we split these into components, right? Because these are angled forces and we can't deal with angled forces. All right. Now these problems can quickly accumulate lots of different symbols and notations. So for simplicity, I'm just going to call this force A and this force B because I'm going to draw components right now. I'm going to split these two uh, forces into their um, X and Y components. Then I'm going to redraw my force diagram showing only those components and not the angled forces. So if I draw in my X and Y components, it would look something like this. I've shown the X components in blue and the Y components here in green. Because I know the angle, I can express each of these components in terms of A and B. Now, it's okay that I don't know A or B, I'm going to write out what BX and BY though are in terms of A and B. AX and BX are both the adjacent sides of the angle that I'm given, so I can use cosine to express them in terms of A and B. And because the Y components are the opposite sides, I can use sine to express them in terms of A and B like so. Now in this case, I also know that the force the Earth exerts on the person will be equal to the mass of the person, 80 kilograms, times our gravitational constant, 9.8. And if I were to calculate that right now, it would give me a value of 784 newtons. We're going to redraw our force diagram now that we have all of our components. And I'm going to call the gravitational force 784 newtons instead of writing it out again for simplicity. So let's redraw our force diagram. Awesome. So I've redrawn my force diagram showing both of those Y components vertical and the X components for BX to the right and AX to the left. And I've written them out in the expression that I obtained using trigonometry. I've also shown the gravitational force on the person as 784 newtons because we calculated that in the previous step. Now, we're solving for A and B in this problem, right? That is the magnitude of the tension force in each cable. So what I want you to notice is that now I have a bunch of forces and my only unknowns are A and B. That's a good step. So we're going to now sum all of the forces in the x and y directions separately and then use Newton's second law to solve for A and B. When doing this, I recommend making a table like I have on the right. I'm going to think about the x and y directions separately. I'll first think about the sum of forces and then set that equal to the mass of the object I'm interested in, the person, times the acceleration of that object in the direction that I'm looking at. So let's add up all our forces in the x direction. Again, we're going to call right in this case positive. So the sum of forces in the x direction would look like this. B cosine 48 minus A cosine 35. And that will be equal to the mass of the person, which is 80 kilograms, times the acceleration of the person in the x direction. And in this case, I know that the person is not moving, so their acceleration again will be zero. That's why we call these problems static equilibrium. Static means not changing, and equilibrium means balanced. So I know that these x forces will be balanced, and I'll solve them in a moment. Now, if I look at the sum of forces in the y direction, I would get an expression that looks like this. My two upward forces, a sine 35 and b sine 48, are added together. They're positive. And I'll subtract 784 newtons, because that is the only downward force I have. And that will be equal to the mass of the person times the acceleration of the person in the y direction, which again is zero. And so now I have two equations and two unknowns. A and B are my two unknowns. So I'm going to write these equations out one more time, and then I'm going to solve them using algebra. So after this step, we are no longer solving a physics problem, and instead we're just doing an algebra problem. So I'm going to write out my equations one more time. All right, I've listed my two equations to the left, and I've just labeled them equation one and equation two. Now, if you have two unknowns, in this case A and B, you have to have two separate equations to be able to solve for them. We call this a system of equations. And don't worry, it's not too bad. What we can do is we can rearrange either equation to isolate A or B, and then we can use substitution to insert that expression for A or B into the other equation. So to begin, I'm going to rearrange equation one 
for b. And then I'm going to plug that expression in to equation 2. Mind you, there are many different ways to go about solving this, so find a way that works best for you. I'll begin rearranging equation 1 by moving the a cosine 35 term to the other side. Once I've done that, I can divide both sides of the equation by cosine 48. And because a is in the numerator on the right-hand side, I can pull it out in front. So I would say that a is multiplied by the cosine 35 divided by cosine 48 degrees. Now at this point, it might be a good idea to approximate cosine 35 over cosine 48 for simplicity if you're not comfortable uh, continuing to write this out in additional steps. This would give me a value of 1.224 times a. So I can take this expression now that b is equal to 1.224a, and I can plug that in into my second equation, like so. I'll go ahead and put that in here, where b shows up. All right, and I've gone ahead and shown that substitution here on the right. So instead of writing b, I've written 1.224a times sine 48. What I'll do now is combine my like terms. Um, before I do that, though, I'll probably move the 784 to the other side because I don't want that on this side of the equation. So I'll move that over to the other side. Then I'll also approximate sine 35, and I'll multiply 1.224 by sine 48 just to simplify all of my terms. And that will look like this. So I've gone ahead and approximated my sine values and multiplied to simplify my like terms. Now I'll add those two coefficients together because a is to the power of 1, so I can add those both together. And I'll get an expression that looks like this. So 1.483a is equal to 784, and then dividing both sides by 1.483 to get rid of my coefficient will give me an a value of 529 newtons. So I know the tension in rope a is 529 newtons. Now, since I solved for b in terms of a earlier, I can actually just plug this in to my expression here for b, and I would get that b is 647 newtons. So there you have it. That is our final answer. Uh, the tension in rope A is 529 newtons, and the tension in rope B is 647 newtons. Now, I know this was a complex example, but keep in mind, the problem-solving process for these does not change. Draw your interaction diagram, draw your force diagram, and split your angled forces into components. Redraw your force diagram using those components, and sum the forces in the x and y directions. Once you've done that, you can set that equal to the uh, mass times acceleration, which in these problems will be zero because we're only dealing with objects at rest. Then you'll have two equations that you can use to solve for both of your unknown variables. Please pause the video, take a moment to review this problem before proceeding. 